Thanks, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, like Pete, I'm going to uh, give an overview of a topic area, and then I'm going to dive into a particular uh, result. Uh, the topic area is the efficiency of OTC markets. So, as Dimitri said, this is about liquidity. We're going to talk about liquidity on the other side of markets, which is where there's no exchange, where if Dimitri wants to sell a corporate bond, he's not exactly sure who's going to give him a good price. Uh, maybe he calls Marcus. Uh, um, Marcus knows that Dimitri knows that his outside option is to go shop around. Marcus similarly will have a similar problem when he uh, acquires the position, he needs to lay it off. Um, and uh, he will take account of what it's worth given that he's going to face the same bargaining problem down the road. There could be information issues as well. It could be that they're asymmetrically informed and it can go either way. So I'm going to. Uh, as I said, start with a general overview of the topic area. I'm going to focus particularly on dealer intermediated OTC markets, although you need not. I think it's where the most exciting research issues are right now. Uh, and I'm going to talk about um, a number of related issues. So you can think of these green dots, uh, for example, like Goldman Sachs, uh, and they specialize in being markets. Uh, the issues that um, are involved in the research agenda, the research that's been done, range across a wide range. Uh, the obvious one is allocated efficiency. Are the gains from trade actually going to get realized? Is Dimitri going to get matched efficiently to Marcus, or is that going to be an inefficient match? How long will it take for the position to ultimately find an investor that um, is appropriate for the trade? Uh, so the allocated issues. And there's the, um, another area of the research, somewhat closely related, on price discovery, price formation, information sharing. So if there's asymmetric information involved, um, how, how much um, does that cost in terms of adverse selection, hold up problems? How long does it take for the information to percolate through the market? Um, uh, how much benefit is there from having post-trade price transparency so that when an OTC trade occurs, the price gets reported. Or from having a benchmark uh, like LIBOR or like the London uh, FX fixing in the afternoon, uh, which when announced gives uh, Dimitri, if he's trading FX, a better idea of what price he should expect markets to offer and that reduces the holdup problem. Market design issues in the literature go to how many of these dealers should we have for the asset that we're dealing with? How, if uh, necessary, should they be regulated? Uh, what, uh, for example, by forcing them to compete for trades on a trade platform? Um, migration of trade onto exchange uh, venues? When is that occurring and uh, uh, how does it occur? Uh, when does it occur and how should it occur? And then financial stability, which I'm not going to talk about today at all, um, but obviously everybody in the room remembers the financial crisis um, heavily implicated OTC markets. So swaps were implicated, the AIG, AIG swaps, repos. Gary wrote a lot about um, how bilateral repo uh, positions were played a key role in the crisis. And of course, those green dots were needed to intermediate um, the bond markets, the swap markets, repo markets, the FX markets, and so on. And if you need the green dots and they're not stable, uh, that's a financial stability issue. They may stop intermediating and they may dump assets onto the market, uh, creating a, a kind of fire sale effect. So the issues here are closely related to um, the ones that Pete raised. Uh, but um, later on, I'll try to do something like what Pete did. I'll try to give you one number that kind of measures liquidity in a certain context. And in this context, taking the market structure as fixed, the number that I'll drive towards in a few minutes is the credit spread of the dealers. That's the number that determines the wedge, the friction, um, that Marcus um, is facing when adding, this goes to his paper on uh, market liquidity and funding liquidity, when adding a position to his balance sheet, his credit spread will be the key number that determines how much he has to add to the bid-ask spread that he offers Dimitri in order to absorb that position. So that's all coming up in the next few minutes. Relevance, well, the OTC markets cover uh, 
the majority of the assets that are actually traded, although the trade frequency is very small by nature, the amount of assets covered is very large relative to exchange uh, traded markets. And these markets are the workhorse markets for operating companies and governments. If they want to trade or to issue, they're typically using instruments in the OTC market, whether it's foreign exchange, <laughs> commodities, bonds, and the like. They're not as frequently using exchange-traded instruments. So the efficiency of the market is relevant to most actors. Um, and the relevance of, in particular, of the green dot, blue dot arrangement I gave you today is especially important in some of the key markets like swaps, government bonds, repos, securities lending, corporate bonds, and so on, currencies, um, and, and of course, um, OTC equities as opposed to exchange traded equities. In the green dot, blue dot arrangement, there's a lot of different degrees of concentration of trade among the green dots. So in this chart, uh, uh, A is municipal bonds, B is securitizations, C is the Fed funds market, D is the interest rate swap market, E is the CDS market, the credit default swap market, and F is the FX forwards market. So the endogenous formation of these dealers is a topic um, area in itself in this uh, literature. There's a lot of research um, saying who are going to be the green dots and how many of them will, will there be. Uh, one of the examples of a result um, that I find quite, quite helpful in this literature is um, from a paper by Chao Jun Wang, who's at Wharton, who shows that um, the number of green dots if you start with everybody in the room might become a green dot, the number of green dots is basically uh, determined by the trade-off between two things. If there are very few green dots, then you get to net the buys and sells on Marcus's balance sheet very efficiently because we won't, Marcus won't have to expand his balance sheet very much. If he's handling all the trades, sort of think law of large numbers, they, all the buys and sells get netted in one place. On the other hand, if there's only Marcus in the market, then everybody's thinking about, oh, a monopoly. Uh, so I think I want to set up trade opportunities with John uh, because that will give me a chance to have them fight against each other uh, to give me better quotes. I still have imperfect markets, but better than they would otherwise be. And in equilibrium, the number of green dots is determined. And by the way, it, not surprisingly, it's fewer green dots uh, for less actively traded assets, but not as few as would be welfare maximizing. Um, okay, so it's going to be impossible to try to give you a sense of the literature in uh, whatever, how many minutes I have left. Not that many. Uh, but uh, what are the key impediments uh, to efficiency in this market? They're overlapping. It's impossible to break them apart. But let me try to give you a sense of what I view as what the literature has told us, some of which uh, I've contributed to on uh, what prevents um, allocative efficiency and price discovery from happening as well as it might. So the first, the first uh, concern is obviously the one that I ra raised when I confronted Dimitri with the issue of facing Marcus. He has a search problem. Uh, and when he searches with Marcus, they have a bargaining problem. Uh, so you can think in terms of, in fact, we did in some work I did on this with Nikolai Gardiano and Lassa Peterson, you can think in terms of borrowing from the monetary and labor literature, like Nobu's <coughs> work on monetary theory, to adapt that to uh, the valuation of long-lived assets, uh, the difference being that the terms of trade uh, depend on the fact that Marcus now has an asset that he needs to lay off later, and so there's kind of a recursive uh, long-term multi-period problem. That problem involves a holdup uh, that I already described. So some of the trades that should have occurred won't occur because um, uh, in, in, in the imperfect cases, uh, Dimitri will not end up finding the terms of trade good enough to even enter the market in the first place. Uh, and some of the issues arise from the, uh, not the holdup problem, but the search, uh, basically the search costs. Now that's all even without considering the fact that Dimitri might not know what the going price is in this market. So the second batch of literature to which I'm referring involves information, the other topic for this uh, session, um, 
uh, Marcus and Dimitri are asymmetrically informed about the value of the asset, and because of the particular structure of this market, um, uh, it's opaque. There, there's no announced going price. In fact, one of the indications of efficiency in this market is a price dispersion. At what, why, how wide is the range of prices at which the same asset gets traded at the same time between different pairs of counterparties in the market? So price dispersion is a good index uh, for how opaque the market is. Uh, and that, uh, that holdup problem can be mitigated uh, by post-trade price transparency. There's a very nice empirical paper by Asquith, Coburn, and Patak um, that shows basically how enforcing a regulation, enforcing post-trade price transparency, the prices are reported, um, affects bid-ask spread and volumes in the corporate bond market. I did some work with um, Piotr uh, Dvorak at the University of Chicago and Hashem Jew at MIT uh, that illustrates how when you have a benchmark, that is you announce the going price in the interdealer market, uh, that benefits entry. So Dimitri would be more likely to go into the market if he knew that the price was amenable to him to trade, in part because now he knows what the going price is, and in part because when he faces Marcus, <laughs> Marcus knows that he knows the going price and he can't gouge him. And that is going to narrow his bid-ask spread and make Dimitri even more likely to enter. So you're going to get more efficient trade uh, uh, and more rapidly. You're also going to get better matching. If Marcus doesn't give him a good price, then Dimitri is going to guess that Marcus actually has a high cost for this particular <coughs> asset at this particular time, and he's going to shop around. Whereas if Marcus gives him a good price relative to the benchmark, he won't shop around. I mentioned to some extent already the, um, the topic area of uh, limits to dealer formation and exchange migration. At what point will um, OTC markets become exchange traded? There's no reason for, that to, for us to expect that to happen efficiently, um, in part because the dealers uh, earn, in most of the markets that I described, they get 100% or a large fraction of the volume of trade that they intermediate, and they earn large bid-ask spreads on that volume of trade. If we went to exchange trading, they would lose a large fraction of the trades to direct um, customer to customer trades, and their bid ask spreads would be smaller. So it's a loose lose for the dealers to encourage the development of exchange traded markets. I have a bit of a conflict there. I worked as an expert on a case that settled last year for $1.8 billion, in which the dealers were alleged to have colluded in order to prevent exchange trading in the credit default swap index market. The one I want to spend uh, my, the balance of my time on, uh, the topic uh, area, is uh, the cost of dealer balance sheet space. So I mentioned kind of to, as a teaser uh, that given a market structure, uh, the credit spreads of the green dots is the key. I think it's uh, or at least one of the very key uh, measures of uh, trading frictions, and I'll explain why. It has to do with what they call funding costs, and uh, sometimes they refer to it cryptically as the cost of balance sheet space. I'm sure you've heard all of that, and I heard it for many years without really knowing exactly what I meant. I thought, well, maybe it means regulatory capital requirements. That does play a role, uh, but I'm going to try to convince you that even if there were no regulations, the cost of balance sheet space would be high to the extent that dealers have a lot of debt um, because their credit spreads are a wedge. That's where we're going in the last, in the last bit. Uh, and I'm going to rely in part uh, most heavily on my work with Leif Anderson, who's an executive at Bank of America Merrill Lynch, and Young Sung, who's at the University of Washington. The other work that's been done in this area is mainly empirical uh, and does show uh, pretty convincingly that the capitalization of the dealers is an important determinant of risk premia in markets. And by the way, that's true also for exchange-traded assets. And I think uh, Pete alluded to that uh, towards the end of his uh, remarks just a few moments ago. So uh, in these last few minutes, uh, since we don't have time to do a fully elaborated, multi-period, complicated, complicated model, I'm going to do a one-period model and I'm going to focus on how Marcus's quotes will depend on his capitalization. So I hope that's 
the problem setting is very clear. His assets are on the left-hand side of the balance sheet of the dealer. And on the right-hand side are debt and equity, to keep it simple. And I'm going to draw these in an untraditional way. The right-hand side is in market value terms, not in accounting terms. So the blue is the market value of Marcus's debt, and the equity is the market value um, of his um, equity. I'm going to use for illustration uh, what's been noted to be a large departure from covered interest parity since the crisis. So on the left-hand side is a chart from Du Tupper and Berdalen that probably many people have seen by now, uh, which shows the divergence on the vertical axis between the cost of borrowing directly in U.S. dollar funding markets versus the cost for borrowing indirectly U.S. dollars by borrowing in a foreign currency and then using the derivatives market to swap it back into dollar borrowing. So the interest rate should be the same if markets were working perfectly by the law of one price. And they don't. And there's various ways to look at it. There's some controversy over exactly how you should measure it, what interest rate should you be looking at. But everybody agrees that there was near perfection pre-crisis and that very large variation away from covered interest parity post-crisis. And that number is, the difference is called the cross-currency basis. I'm not going to focus where exactly, um, how the basis is determined, but I'm going to focus on the arbitrage bounds implied by Marcus's balance sheet when he's uh, thinking about arbitraging this basis. The thing that may also have occurred to you, and you can see it on the right-hand chart, is that when the basis was tiny, the dealers were getting very small costs for funding in debt markets. So the vertical axis on the right-hand chart is the credit default swap rates, or credit spreads, of the dealers. Pre-crisis, they were tiny. The cost of getting balance sheet space in the pre-crisis period was way too small relative to social efficiency because the dealers were too big to fail. Because our balance sheet costs were so small, Marcus would absorb almost any uh, balance sheet expanding trade that earned him just a few basis points in order to capture this, um, this uh, arbitrage. Post-crisis, um, the cost for getting space on Marcus's balance sheet expanded enormously in terms of the cost for funding, which are credit spreads, and the basis uh, was allowed to widen dramatically as well. How am I doing on time? Like five minutes? Is it seven minutes? Good, thank you. So I'm going to give you a little model, uh, very short and simple, uh, that will help us understand why it's Marcus's credit spreads. And I'll assert, and you can read our paper, it's not his regulatory capital requirements that are causing the big cost of balance sheet space post-crisis. So here's the trade that Marcus is considering. On the right-hand side of the chart, you can see that he's added a US dollar asset by borrowing euros and swapping it into dollars. And on the, I was on the left-hand side of his balance sheet assets. On the, on the liability side, he's borrowed in US dollar funding markets to do that. And when he does that, um, because this is a relatively safe asset, he's actually, and we can show that we prove this uh, carefully in the paper, He's improved the position of his legacy creditors. So the market value of the dark blue legacy debt has gotten bigger. <coughs> and that's very important. You can see that from the black line. Marcus's creditors like this trade. If he traded at fair value, if there were no arbitrage profit, his equity owners just lost money. <coughs> the only way that Marcus can make money on this trade is if he can buy that dollar asset at lower than market value. So he's going to offer, he's only going to enter this trade when the arbitrage is big enough relative to that difference, uh, that, that wedge uh, or reduction in equity value, which by the way has a name in the industry. It's called the funding value adjustment. So the industry actually, when Marcus says, wants to do this trade, he calls up to Treasury and says, I, I got an arbitrage, it's positive PL, I'm not kidding, and I need $100 million. They're going to say, fine. But we're going to subtract from your PL your funding costs, and we're charging you at our credit spread. If Marcus's bank is not well capitalized, I won't name names, uh, then that will discourage him from offering narrow bid ask spreads. If he's well capitalized, JP Morgan, there'll still be a funding value adjustment. JP Morgan has made more than a billion of that. 
um, but it won't be as big. And then I'll just move on. Um, here's the simple model. At time one, the dealer's assets pay some amount A, it's a random variable, and it has some liabilities, L. The dealer is considering this new trade, which has a total payoff per unit of Y, some random variable Y. The funding requirement, in this case, the amount of dollars that Marcus has to raise to enter the trade, can depend on the quantity of the trade. The per unit, because I'm going to do everything at the margin, funding requirement is some number, little u. So everything is going to be at the margin. And I'm going to take the base case, because we don't have time to do all the cases which are in the paper. This trade is entirely funded by unsecured debt, which, by the way, is the norm for the go-to marginal source of funding. I'll skip the technical assumptions. Post-trade, Marcus's balance sheet consists of assets, which are his original assets plus the quantity Q of the new asset. Post-trade, his new liabilities are the old liabilities plus the amount of funding he needed multiplied by the payoff on the funding. That payoff is the risk-free rate R plus his credit spread, which will play the key role. Since we're going to do everything at the margin, you can show that his credit, marginal credit spread is the same as the bank's general unsecured credit spread. We'll call that number big S. That big S is the number that I advertise right on the title slide. That's the index of trading frictions in this market. G is the marginal gain in value to the shareholders of Marcus's firm. When he is doing a trade, he's not trading on behalf of the whole balance sheet, both debt and equity. He's trading on behalf of his shareholders. He's maximizing return on equity. So when he does the trade, he needs to consider not what's the PL, but what's the PL after funding costs. And that G is exactly that number. And it's a risk neutral, discounted, expected payoff to equity, considering the equity uh, default option value, which is not that big, but it generates a credit spread that's big enough to create a wedge. The result, this gain to first order, that is the explicit marginal gain, is uh, the trading profit on the trade, and you have to normalize it by a constant P star, which is the survival probability very close to one. Then there is a, whoops, then there is a, um, a asset substitution term, which doesn't play a role in this discussion because this is not a risky asset. And then there's the funding value adjustment, which is fee. That funding value adjustment is, just let's go to the bottom of the slide, it's basically the credit spread of Marcus's firm multiplied by the amount of funding required for the trade. So per unit of dollar that he, of he does, that he does at this trade, he is, his shareholders are incurring a cost equal to his credit spread up to a very small order of tolerance. So example, the covered interest parity violations have been about 25 basis points. Dealer funding costs have been north of 35 basis points. Every time he makes a positive arbitrage 25 basis point profit by exploiting this trade, 35 basis points of that profit goes to his creditors, negative 10 basis points goes to his shareholders. Marcus says, I'm not interested. I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to let the covered interest parity violations move until they start to exceed my funding costs. That is a wedge in this market. Um, there's the one-year uh, funding cost pre-crisis and post-crisis. Surprisingly, and this is a bit of an aside from some new work I'm doing with Antje Berndt and Icho, Icho Ju, credit spreads have blown out dramatically post-crisis, but you know, thanks to the regulators uh, in the room and other regulators, the banks are much better capitalized. How could that be? How could the, the banks be way better capitalized and yet have way bigger credit spreads? Because of the other regulation, failure, resolution, these banks are no longer viewed as too big to fail. Whether or not we believe too big to fail is over, creditors take it to heart. They charge dramatically higher credit spreads uh, post-crisis relative to pre-crisis for the same equity capital buffer. The credit rating agencies have actually taken out explicit notches for sovereign uplift. They've removed the assumption of too big to fail in the credit ratings. And at a given default probability, this is from the same new research I'm doing, at a given probability of default, the CDS rate, this is from a big panel regression, um, for a large bank, a GSIB, has gone from a low number pre-crisis to a high number. 
This is not how has, have credit spreads changed. This is at a given default probability, what's the estimated credit spread pre-crisis versus post-crisis? So there's been a dramatic shift due to the daily resolution rules uh, to increase the illiquidity of certain um, OTC markets, particularly safe asset markets. Um, I think I'm out of time, so I'm going to stop right there. Thank you very much.